and HDA. Write that down. It's going to be the final exam. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. It's the military in Hawaii. We're going to talk about the 2022 MAC and HDA partnership and conference that took place a little while ago. And we have for this discussion Connie Lau, the recently re retired CEO of HEI. And she learned a lot in that period of time. And we're going to share all of that knowledge with you today. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Connie. And we have Jason Chung, who is uh, also a member of the MAC Committee for the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and um, we're going to talk about, you know, this conference. We're going to talk about this partnership. We're going to talk about what it does for the military, for the country, and for Hawaii. Welcome to the show, both of you. Okay. Great to be here, Jay. So, uh, Connie, let's start with you. Uh, you've been involved in the Chamber of Commerce Military Affairs Council since 1922, am I right? 1922, <laughs> oh my God, Jay. <laughs> now, in that case, I can say I wasn't even born then. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about was, how you got it, involved yeah. in it and what, you, what you've done for it and with it. Sure, yeah, no, but I have been involved with the Military Affairs Council, the Chamber, or the MAC, for quite a while. And actually, the guy who got me involved is the current board chair of API, Admiral Tom Fargo. Um, and he, of course, was the commander of the ACOM Pacific region, now the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and, you know, he told me how important uh, the military was to Hawaii and that API is the largest publicly traded company here really needed to get involved and understand um, the significance of what they did here. Um, and so it's just been amazing uh, to me, Jay, to have gotten involved. Um, I frankly have learned so much about the significance of the military, which of course is the second largest driver of our economy and, and during times like COVID actually becomes the driver of the economy. Um, but, you know, I grew up here. And I got to say, you know, even though I grew up here and the military's been here ever since I was a little kid, in fact, behind me is Kaneohe Bay. I grew up right across from uh, the Marine Corps base there. Um, I had no idea about the significance of what is done out of here. And also, you know, to Hawaii's advantage, there's a ton of investment that has been coming in from uh, Department of Defense and the federal government into Hawaii because of our very, very strategic location. So, you know, when when, um, when I was a kid, uh, and I was a kid here, Connie, I, I'm not a, not a young kid, but a kid, nevertheless. <laughs> Some people think I'm a kid now. Back in 1922, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, right. In the good old days. They talked about Hawaii's economy as a, as a three-legged stool. Okay. One was one was agriculture, of course. Uh, one was hospitality, of course, and one was the military. Well, agriculture, you know, ain't what it was, and so we have two legs left. Um, we have um, hospitality, which is struggling right now, but but still a, an important important uh, part of our economy. Um, and we have the military, and I wonder if you could comment on that on exactly uh, how the trajectory has been uh, since, uh, say, statehood uh, in terms of that particular leg of the stool. Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Has it gone sideways? And where is it going? Yeah, so um, Jay, maybe I can start a little bit earlier, or not earlier, but later than that, um, because it's quite uh, clear with the whole pivot to the Pacific and how important this region is, I think, there's a lot of people who talk about the Indo-Pacific region as being the most consequential uh, for the United States because, of course, it has some of the largest economies. It's got um, some of the largest armies in the area, and it's got our largest adversaries. Um, and we know who all of uh, who those are and how concerned um, everyone is about it, including the general public, when you start talking about uh, issues like um, potential cyber warfare. Um, and so that's the reason why I talked about uh, all the incoming investment into Hawaii to help ensure uh, national security, but also that really benefits Hawaii because we 
um, automatically benefit by getting a much more secure location here in the Pacific. Um, what are the, it, it, you know, you, we're here to talk about the partnership uh, conference, and it's interesting that this is the first year that it is not only the MAC partnership conference, but also the Hawaii Defense Alliance, or HDA, um, partnership conference. And the reason for that is that uh, as more and more investment is coming in here, um, it's bringing very high, uh, uh, it's bringing jobs that require a high amount of expertise and also thankfully pay very good compensation. And so what the MAC has done uh, under a grant from DBED is to look at really build, building out uh, the um, uh, job pipeline here in Hawaii to ensure that some of these great jobs that are coming in uh, don't just go to um, you know people that are brought in from the mainland or wherever because we don't have the skill sets here in Hawaii. We're trying to work really closely with the universities and with the businesses, uh, the folks that are already involved in the defense economy here to help uh, small businesses uh, build out their skills so that they can compete for those federal contracts, uh, build out the school system, uh, you know, starting from when kids are just in secondary school right through college and graduate school so that they can earn the, the degrees, the certifications that will position them well for these jobs. That's something Jason's really, really involved in is that creation of the partnership, and it's going community-wide, okay? Like I say, it's academia, it's uh, private sector, and of course, most definitely, it's the military. Very important that we, we the community, understand um, what the jobs are in the military. And I, when I say jobs, I don't limit that to individual employment. I include the contract jobs, uh, the work we can do, we, we our companies can do. And, and my impression over the years has been there was, there was a time when we really didn't read the manuals. So we didn't feel that we could compete with mainland companies that wanted to come in. Um, and then I, I guess it was around the 90s when local businesses started to read the manuals. Said, yeah, we can do this. Uh, we can, you know, we can, uh, you know, get get the qualifications. We can meet the contract specifications. We can be involved, and so it's been, you know, an upward trajectory uh, ever since those companies did that. But Jason, let me go to you. Um, How did you get involved in this? You have a military career behind you. Uh, what did you do, and for what service? Uh, hey, Jay. Thanks. Uh, well, I was in the army. You know, I was born and raised here, uh, like Connie, and grew up here. Uh, but then I joined the uh, army about 36 years ago. Uh, who's counting? Army. Uh, I, it, it was about 1923, I think, when I was <laughs> and, uh And I was an intelligence officer uh, in the Army. I spent a lot of time of uh, my career in, in the special operations community. Uh, but when I retired, my last duty station was here in Hawaii. And when I retired, I already had a job lined up with a tech company. In fact, that's my, my primary employment. But I was approached by two individuals, uh, Jennifer Sabas, one who I think you know, and also my classmate uh, from college, uh, now retired Major General Susie Barris Lum, uh, East West. Oh, you mean uh, East West Center Susie? That's who you mean? Yes. yes. We so, love her. We, we absolutely, not as much as Connie, but we right. love her. <laughs> oh, I love Susie too. Yeah. We all love Susie, beautiful. right? Uh, yeah. So, and they approached me about, uh, you know, belonging to the MAC and joining the MAC. And, and I, I knew a little about the MAC, but then I just researched it a little bit and I thought, what a perfect fit, right? Two things that have been a big part of my life that I care a lot about, right? The military and obviously Hawaii. And so I started working also with the MAC and got exposed to people like Connie too as well, right? Which was just, just amazing. And so that's how I got initially involved uh, in, in the MAC. Hey, help us understand, sorry, Connie. Sorry, can I break in just for a moment? Because I remember when Jason, uh, he was really like the perfect person for us because coming out of the intelligence community, he really understood that whole universe and the military universe. And, you know, going back 
to our small businesses and getting the contract and working with DOD, it's not necessarily easy. Boy, um, you know, there are so many uh, rules and regulations, and particularly now with uh, the concern about cyber, uh, you've got to have all kinds of standards um, to keep your uh, the information safe. And so it was really good to have somebody like Jason who understood that. And that's frankly a lot of what the MAC can do for the small businesses that are here, the academic institutions that are here, is we can kind of be that bridge between the two worlds so that we can actually take much better advantage of um, what is being offered. Yeah, uh, yeah, part of that is training and familiarization, um, and, and that's the DBET grant, isn't it, to try to out, uh, outreach to local companies and um, give them comfort, give them training, give them familiarity. It's all, it's all there. So, Jason, um, I, I could ask this to either of you, but I'll ask you, who exactly is the MAC? Uh, what, what kind of an organization is it, and do you enjoy spending time there? And how much fun exactly do you have? <laughs> well, yeah, it's a ton of fun. I mean, uh, you know, two of your favorite people, right? Connie Lau and and, uh, and Susie Vari Slum, you know, uh, are members of the MAC. And so, you know, being being associated with with professionals like that um, is just extremely rewarding, you know, from a professional standpoint as well as a personal standpoint. But to get to your question about who is the MAC, right? So the MAC, if you look at it, it's a cross section of a lot of key stakeholders here in Hawaii. You have business leaders, right? So like Connie, um, other companies that are out there that are representative. And then you have your traditional uh, businesses that you would associate with the Department of Defense, like your Booz Allens, your Lockheed Martins, your Huntington Eagles, et cetera. You have academia, right? Academic institutions, you're a part of it. You have uh, uh, folks from the Coldale and Staffdale that are members of it because they see the, the significant importance and this consequential relationship between Hawaii uh, and the military. You have the military. Uh, and then you have community stakeholders, um, folks from the community who realize the important role that the military plays uh, here in Hawaii and how important it is to kind of stay linked with what the military is doing. So in a nutshell, that's basically the MAC, right? It's a, a group of really key stakeholders that come together to advocate uh, for the military here in Hawaii, but also be kind of that um, element that links the military back to the community and gets it ingrained within the community and within from a culture and partnership perspective as well. Yeah, I take it the, the MAC is state government. Sorry, well, let's not yeah. forget state government too, because um, yes. uh, Senate President and Speaker, they all are uh, very involved and. Uh, it, you know, it 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 takes the village, and of course, uh, General Hara who's head of the Hawaii Department of Defense and also our National Guard here, is very, very active in the uh, MAC. Uh, so it, it, it really spans the gamut, Bay. How many, how many people, how many members? Oh, yeah. Roughly, roughly. R roughly, it's about 80 folks. Mm. Well, that's it's impressive. Yeah. So uh, let, now like, let me compare that with the uh, HDA, the Hawaii Defense Alliance. I'm making a guess here. I'm guessing that the Hawaii Defense Alliance is more like the military players. Am I right? Um, actually, Jay, it's it's very similar to the MAC when you when you look at it. I mean, as as Connie lined out, like what the Hawaii Defense Alliance is doing, but why, you know, what the MAC also does. It's almost a more formal arrangement of many of the initiatives that the MAC was pushing, right? Which was how do we, you know, integrate right business with the federal government in terms of all the different opportunities out there. So the Hawaii Defense Alliance, right, was the grant between DBED as well as uh, with the Department of Defense to go, hey, if in fact the military Department of Defense is their second eco economic driver, you really need to create a defense alliance that specifically looks at how to grow more opportunities for local businesses in Hawaii. So one correction, to a point that you made earlier, Jay, about you said in the 90s, people start to read the manual and says, hey, we can, we think we can do this. It's not just the mainland companies. It's actually, you know, the military recognized that back when they stood up Pearl Harbor back in the 1900s. You know, when they stood up the, when they stood up Pearl Harbor, they start to realize, hey, we're having a difficult time getting these critical trades really to support 
the shipyard, right? Welders, um, you know, ship repair folks, um, pipe fitters, et cetera. They realized that the only way forward was to build that capability here from which was born the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard Internship Program, which is very famous uh, here. Uh, and so they re recognized that that was actually part of, it helps really your readiness of the force when you have a very strong local industrial base. Um, and that's why when you look at the federal government, the federal government has a 20% set aside for small businesses, specifically trying to target local businesses within that area because they mm -hmm. know it plays a significant role. That's good policy. Readiness. Correct, right? Because if you have the community there, you know, as, especially when you look at in Hawaii, you know, in Hawaii, because of cost of living and some other things, if you're able to actually recruit people who are from Hawaii and want to live in Hawaii and know the expense and the, the other things associated with living in Hawaii, you're really able to kind of stabilize and have a much more uh, stable workforce than if you're constantly trying to hire and bring folks from the West Coast or from the East Coast. You know, and as Connie mentioned, there's a number of jobs now uh, that, yes, Pearl Harbor is still the largest industrial employer here in Hawaii, but there's a, a really good um, data points that point that there's this new emerging industry that's primarily in this technical field. So that includes things like cyber, it includes things like intelligence, right, my former life, data science, which is really huge, and just uh, information technology at large. In fact, we're calling it really the second Pearl Harbor in terms of the amount of jobs and opportunities that there are. And the services here and the organizations, as well as the contracting companies, are trying to figure out how do we attract this high-level skill labor here to Hawaii to fill all these jobs you know, that are emerging now within these different, within this. Uh, oh, that different. warms my heart. <laughs> We've been trying to do that for so long. This is a, a very noble cause and good for everyone involved, especially the state. So Connie, um, how much of this was discussed at the, the conference between the partnership of MAC and the Hawaii Defense Alliance in the first week of January? They had a big conference. Um, is what Jason is talking about, was that discussed? And, and if not, what else was discussed? So it totally was discussed and, and was uh, probably half of the conference, uh, Jay. So as I mentioned, normally it's just the MAC partnership conference. This is the first year that we had MAC and HDA because we really wanted to highlight the fact that there are these great jobs and there's a lot of work that's been going on to link our community to those jobs and build the pathways. Uh, so that was, in fact, almost the entire second day that went on. Um, on day one, we had our keynote speakers, and of course, we uh, uh, our kickoff speaker was Admiral Aquilino, the um, commander for uh, Indo PACOM, who has his office up at uh, Camp Smith. Um, and then uh, from our own Hawaii National Guard and Hawaii Department of Defense, we had General Ken Hara. Um, and as you know, it was great to hear Kenny talk about how active forces were uh, during COVID because you know we saw them at the airports helping out with security. We helped. We saw them at the vaccination clinics. Uh, you name it. In addition to their uh, regular jobs where some of them were deployed overseas. They, were all, they also went to the Capitol uh, in, in DC to help uh, provide security there. Uh, so uh, they were our two uh, kickoff speakers. And then we did uh, have some speakers on Red Hill uh, because as we all know, that's a huge it's issue. It's been very hot, yeah. Yeah, very, very hot. Uh, and really important in those kinds of discussions to make sure that everybody really has a handle on what the facts are and what areas still need to be investigated so that we can determine what the real facts are. And then the folks that need to make the decisions can make good sound decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked about the other big issues like training leases. Um, so, yeah, you name it. All the things that are important uh, to the military presence here. Well, it's, a, it's, an, in, in, it's intertwined with everything in the state, you know. 
Um, my, my recollection is that Pearl Harbor, which was the first military facility here, was established in the year 1850 originally. So it's a long cultural tie between the military and uh, the civilian communities. So I, I wanted to get to um, you know one other thing, and that is um, you know we live in a, in geopolitical um, transitional times, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and Asia is more important now uh, than it was. And we we heard about the pivot during the Obama administration, but then we got you know sidetracked maybe into the Middle East a little. Um, and now we're back to look at Asia. It's really important, especially because of the rise of China and uh, the change in circumstances around China. But how does that, the geopolitical, what do you want to call it, um, transition, the geopolitical changes, how does that affect all of this? Because, you know, there was talk a few years ago about moving, moving a substantial part of the military force from Hawaii to Guam. I don't know if that happened or it could happen. Um, if there are changes in the way the military is deployed around, um, you know, the Pacific, then there would be changes in the way that touches Hawaii, right? Well, so why don't I start and then I'll let uh, Jason uh, take over. And I think probably the number one thing, Jay, is, as I mentioned, this has clearly become the most consequential region in the world uh, for the United States. And because of that, that's the reason why the investment is coming in. Um, the uh, movement that you were thinking about was uh, really from Okinawa. The Marines were going to move out of Okinawa to Guam and Hawaii. And that has been happening, albeit at a slower pace than what people had originally thought. And that's primarily because uh, the infrastructure needs to be built out uh, in uh, places like Guam and Hawaii in order to uh, have uh, those troop movements um, to those locations. Uh, but that is underway, and it is still the plan to have them come in. Uh, the, uh, one of the other major, major shifts is, uh, you know, everybody talks about um, asymmetric risk. And probably the biggest asymmetric risk is the change in warfare from the kinetic or physical war to uh, cyber warfare. Uh, so much easier to uh, 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 penetrate software systems and uh, missile systems than it is to actually uh, take over that uh, weapon physically. Uh, and so that's why uh, so much focus has gone into much more of these technical jobs. Um, you know, we should mention that um, our universities here have been doing a very good job in positioning uh, to help um, develop these careers. Um, in particular, University of Hawaii uh, has several of its campuses that have been named schools of excellence uh, by the NSA. Uh, and also, hopefully, uh, they have an application in from the Office of the Department director of national intelligence to become named centers of excellence in the intelligence field as well. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, all, all the, everything that happens around the world, and particularly in this region, Jay, uh, puts more of the focus on Hawaii and more of the um, uh, investment uh, directing towards Hawaii, since we are one of the most forward deployed physical locations um, that are still U.S. territory. Ah. When, when, when you add um, Indo to PACOM, which happened a few years ago, how does that change the mission, the role of the military in Hawaii? Because it seems to me there's more geography involved, more issues, more geopolitical activity. Uh, how does that change things? You know, so I said I was going to let Jason have some a few words. So let okay, me well, let's let's go to that. Jason. Yeah. So I could see that Jason was winding up to answer that. I know. <laughs> no, I mean that's a great question, Jay. I mean, it's because it's the recognition of how significant India is to the region, right? Um, especially as you start to look at the trends that Connie had mentioned in terms of economies of scales of militaries, um, economic flow of goods that go throughout the area and the region. 
Uh, and quite honestly, the expansion of China as it moves out into other areas with their One Belt, One Road initiative. And it's really becomes, you know, how they start to really compete. It's not just asymmetric, what Connie talked about. It's, it's what's been termed as, you know, great power competition. It's using other instruments of national power. It's diplomacy, it's information, misinformation, disinformation. It's economies at scale, right? So when you look how China is investing in the 5G network within Indonesia, uh, under the guise of, hey, let us help you with COVID because we can help you kind of do the contact tracing. But now it's their 5G network in there. When they put up a rail network within Malaysia or they invest in fisheries within Oceania, uh, and it's really a debt entrapment uh, kind of tactic that the China uh, often uses. The other key component of that is, is technology, right? So technology is good. And technology has also equaled the playing field because one thing that is really critical uh, when you talk about geography, um, Jay, is that, you know, our military now, the United States military, is really no longer forward positioned, right? If you look a number of years back, we were forward positioned in key, key areas. We had a lot of folks in Korea, in, in, in the East, because we saw that as a potential uh, significant threat a lot in Europe. But when you actually look at the, at the forces that are there now, they're not that significant, right? And so we, we are a, uh, a force projection force that has to go to an area. Now, the implication of that is that, quite honestly, many of our competitors and potential adversaries have a geographical uh, advantage in terms of positioning, right? They are already positioned in critical areas in, in these different regions of the world, right? So imagine playing basketball and someone basically gives you the key to the center court and you have that, you're geographically positioned we have to now try to outmaneuver them to, to maintain our advantage. But what technology has done, it has is, it is leveled that playing field. So when you look at China and Russia primarily and what they've done in technological advances. So as we're talking about data science, we're talking about cyber, you know, China is very forward leaning in terms of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, and developing uh, very sophisticated algorithms that are being able to leverage, you know, very large swaths of data. And I think anyone that you talk to now, whether it's in the business community or in the military, will tell you that the new gold, the new oil, right, is data. It's being able to uh, manage and effectively um, leverage a data to your, to your advantage, to have a decision advantage. So that is our challenge. And it goes back to Connie's point of why the focus is, is so relevant here. Uh, on island now with the military in terms of how do we counter those things? And that's why you're seeing this big push now in terms of modernization, innovation, uh, and disruptive technologies. And how do we leverage that here in Hawaii to more effectively compete, right, in the most consequential region in the world today and in the future? And that requires a whole bunch of stuff. It requires, you know, how do we move that workforce uh, that is still kind of in uh, not in a legacy world, but how do we modernize that workforce to be able to support those different types of jobs, as well as the uh, you know the infrastructure to support our our new uh, techniques and our new uh, uh, systems that the military wants to bring on to try and counter and mitigate right uh, what China and Russia have been able to develop over here in the last ten years or so. Wow, um, Jay, everybody. My fabulous you know, yeah. Connie, we love having techie guys on the show. This is this is Think Tech Hawaii. And when people talk like Jason, oh, this is center of the channel for us, you know? Yeah, now, now you know why we were just so delighted when Jason joined the MAC. But, you know, I was going to add, Jay, and everybody, and you mentioned it earlier, have been trying so hard to diversify this economy, diversify this economy. I mean, frankly, when you hear the kinds of jobs that uh, Jason's talking about, my gosh, this is the best opportunity that Hawaii has to diversify our economy. Because in this case, it's not a matter of creating the jobs. The jobs exist. We just got to figure out how we can fill them. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I, I remember a, uh, a recruiter uh, from, from the military came out here uh, because they were having trouble, this is 10 years ago, uh, they were having trouble finding people who were interested and qualified. Uh, hopefully we can meet that demand. Hopefully we can provide everybody. 
Let me ask you this, Connie. I mean, it, it seems like such a ripe pomegranate. I use that term uh, uh, that um, people on the mainland, you know, young people, people who have just graduated with computer science and cyber and what have you, uh, would find out about this and would come here and would look for those jobs. This seems this is what happened under Act 221 back 20 years ago. Uh, when it became clear that there was investment to support development of tech companies, people would come from far away for those jobs. Wouldn't that happen? Isn't that happening? Won't that happen here? Yes, absolutely, Jay. Um, and that's the reason for this HDA effort, this Hawaii Defense Alliance, uh, to build that out and get the word out there. Um, but, you know, it's not just getting the word out there. I mean, we have to build the infrastructure. We have to build the programs. Uh, we have to build the pathways so that when the people come, they can actually realize it and they can actually get into those jobs. Yeah, and great, all good, all good. So we're pretty much out of time, but I wanna ask you guys for uh, takeaways. That is what you would leave with our audience for them to remember the show by and to carry with them as they think about the subject going forward. I mean, a lot of people do not know about the MAC or, or the uh, HDA. They do not know what the military does. Uh, they, uh, they may be carrying around negative feelings about it, who knows? Um, but we, we have to show them the way and we have to teach them about it. We have to have more shows like this. That's why the military in Hawaii is here on Think Tech, you know? Um, so I, I'd like you to, uh, Jason, you go first. I'd like you to, you know, give your message to the, the viewing audience. Tell them what you would like to uh, leave with them about this discussion. Thanks, Jay. I, I think it's what Connie said. We have a tremendous opportunity that's be, that right now uh, with all the available uh, opportunity that's out there, the, the terrific partnership that we have throughout the MAC, the HDA with the state. We really need to take advantage of it right now. We're, ha we're just at the cusp having the dialogues and discussions with all the key stakeholders, right? We're building those different programs that are going to kind of lead sector partnerships, workforce development, educational pathways that support all these technical uh, jobs that are up, uh, coming up uh, because of what we talked about. Um, but we've got to seize the moment and we got to keep talking uh, and engaging and collaborating. Thanks. Connie, you are, you, you know, been watching the business community in Hawaii being a, a part of it for so many years. You probably have a lot of thoughts about the future of our economy. Um, you know, Dan in no way wanted this to happen. I'm sure he would be happy hearing this discussion. Hi, Dan. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm interested, so interested in how you see this unfolding going forward. How you see this, this uh, second or third leg of the of the uh, of the stool functioning, uh, the the pro trajectory of the military business connection under the MAC and under the HDA going forward. What's it going to do for us? What's it going to do for our economy? Well, I, I think we've ar we've already described how it's getting off to a really solid start with all the right players at the table, and that's what it takes. You know, it it, it it's the old takes a village, um, and so. I think we have the right players at the table. Um, we have the interest from everyone. And, and, you know, I hate to say this, but a lot of times they say it's all about self-interest. And as you can hear from this whole discussion today, everybody has a self-interest in making this happen. Um, clearly, the military wants it to happen because they uh, need the functionality uh, of intelligence and data science and all of the uh, operations that are here, and they need people for that, so they've got an interest in it. Uh, Hawaii, our uh, legislatures, our governors, state government, uh, they have an interest in it because we want to diversify our economy, and particularly we want to diversify it with much uh, you know, higher-paying, skilled jobs. Um, and by the way, you don't have to have even a college degree uh, to um, have some of these jobs. Uh, uh, part of the HDA is creating a certification program. And sometimes, particularly when you're dealing with computers, those certifications mean more than just degrees. Um, and of course, um, you know, the private sector here, not only here, but also nationally, you, you've got the big defense contractors that are helping participate because they have an interest 
because if they're going to win some of the contracts here in Hawaii, they've got to have the workforce as well. And as Jason said, it's much better if you've got a local workforce uh, that is that tends to be more stable. And we all know that Hawaii people can compete with the best from anywhere in the world. They just have to be given the opportunity to do that. So that's that's what I would say, Jay. I, I definitely see it coming, um, and I think we've got all the right players uh, at the table to make it happen. Well, thank you, Connie. Thank you for many things. Uh, thank you for being on this MAC committee in, in your retirement, end quote. <laughs> and thank you for coming on the show, and thank you for your support of ThinkTech over the years. It's been wonderful from the time we first opened our doors, you were there, and here we are again. I remember everything so well. And thank you, Jason. Uh, it makes me want to go back in the service or at least join the Mac anyway. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on and sharing. It's been a great discussion with you guys. Thanks, aloha. Thanks, Jason.